If you look there at chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, we find that Jesus has gone from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And as Chris read for us, beginning in verse 3, the Pharisees came up to him and they tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you read what he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Well, why did, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been sold from birth, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. As we get into this passage this morning, and as we think about the commitment that Jesus calls for, let's begin with a little bit of background. Let's understand what it was they were asking and what Jesus was saying here. Divorce and remarrying was rampant among the Jews at this time. If you can imagine a time that is worse than it is today, in which our marriages are just being cast aside and, and people uh, divorce and remarry for any and every reason... If you can imagine a time that it was worse than that, this was probably the time. It is said that divorce and remarriage was terrible among the Jews and that it was even worse among the Greeks. Those that weren't Jews even had a worse reputation of divorcing and remarrying. And then it is said that among the Romans it was even worse than the Greeks. And so the Pharisees come to Jesus and they ask then this question. Can we divorce for any cause? Can a man put away his wife? Can a man divorce, release his wife? The word here is apoluo, a compound word. From apo mean from, luo, loose. To loose from. Can a man loose his wife from himself? Can, can he divorce? Can he send her away from any, for any cause? This was a word that was used in the Bible for divorce and also in first century literature translated divorce. That is the question. Can they do that? Now, remember that d divorce was a male prerogative in Judaism. Uh, in some situations, women were able to persuade the courts into divorcing them. And there were some women that did divorce their husbands, but this was seen as an outrage by the Jews. The Pharisees came here, and they weren't asking so much if it were permissible. That was assumed by almost every Jew, but they were wanting Jesus to know, what's, what's the grounds for divorce? What is it? What, what are the reasons have to be? They were trying to get Jesus to take a side into two schools of thought at the time. The passage about which they argued about in one particular phrase in this passage is in 20, Deuteronomy chapter 24, the first four verses. It reads this way, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. Remember that phrase. That's, that's the phrase that they had the discussion about. If he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if he goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. What had happened since those words were written years and years ago was there were two kind of schools of thought that had come about. One was led by a fellow named Shema, the Shema school of thought. And basically, he looked at this and said that, that this, was a, um, this was sexual unfaithfulness. This indecency that is talked about here in Deuteronomy 24, that was sexual unfaithfulness. But then there was a school of thought from Hillel that said the indecency was basically anything that displeased the husband. Uh, really, it, was, it didn't matter what it was. If it was just something that 
uh, she did that he didn't like, then that was grounds for divorce. Well, they were testing Jesus. They were testing Jesus to see if they could get him on one side or the other. They thought if, if we can get him to agree with the, with the school of thought of Shema, then, then these other folks are going to be upset and he's going to be discredited. Or if we can get him to, to agree with Hillel, then, then the folks with Shema will be, will be upset and will discredit him. Testing is from the word here, uh, periodzo, and it can be translated as tempting. Same word, by the way, that's used for Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And so they were trying to, to catch Jesus in this blunder and, and use his answer to turn the crowds against him. But what, did they not, what they did not expect is the way Jesus answered. What they did not expect is that Jesus basically didn't take either side. Here's what Jesus said. Don't you know, don't you realize that God created them from the beginning as male and female? That God created these two distinct Sexes. This quotation comes from Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them him. Created he them. A man then is to leave his father and mother. And the ESV says, hold fast. A lot of the translations say, cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. A quotation from Genesis 2, 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the, the leaving and the cleaving principle, right? You leave mother, mother and father and you cleave to your wife and they will be one flesh. Leave is from the word katalipo, which means to give up. You're, 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 it's not that you're uh, completely uh, disowning your father and mother, but you're leaving that family, joining to another. Join comes from the word kalao, and it has within it the idea of gluing or cementing something together. That you are joined here in verse 5, that, that gluing or cementing together. And in this joining, they become then one flesh. And then he says, What then God has joined together, do not separate. Now the word for joined here is different. It's suzugnima, which literally means yoked together. But basically has the same meaning as joined in verse 5 and verse 6. They're just... Two different words, basically with the same meaning. What God has joined together, do not separate. What he, has, what he has put together, do not take apart. Separate comes from the word corizito, which means to separate or to divorce. It means to take something apart. It's also one of the words used uh, in the Bible as well as first century literature for divorce. What God has joined together, you don't separate. You see, Jesus says, you're asking the wrong question. It's not about how, how can we put our wives away. It's not about what are the reasons that you can give us that we can say, I don't want to be married to you anymore, I want to be married to someone else. Jesus says, the question you should be asking is, how can we stay together? The question you should be asking is, what can I do to make sure that I stay with my wife? You see, the, 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 the Pharisees as well as other Jews were kind of in the habit of, of divorcing and remarrying and divorcing and remarrying and on and on and on. And Jesus says, no. Jesus says, what God has joined together, don't separate. Don't take that apart. Well then, still not satisfied, they say, well now wait a minute. What about Moses? What about Moses and what he said in Deuteronomy 24? What about the fact that, that he said we could write a bill of divorcement? And Jesus says, that was because of the hardness of your hearts. It was because your hearts were hard, not because what God wanted or what God wants. Sclerocardia, a compound word from scleros meaning heart and cardia. I mean, scleros meaning hard and cardia meaning heart. A hard heart. Jesus says, that wasn't because that's what God wanted. That's not God's uh, original intention. The commandment of Moses was simply regulating what was already taking place. Through Moses, God recognized and allowed divorce, but that was not what he wanted and not what he wants. People were using Moses' instructions as an, as an excuse and a reason to break their marriage commitments. But these instructions were intended to protect marriage. And that's what Jesus wants them to understand. He says, no, no, don't look for reasons. Don't, don't come up with ways that you can divorce, instead come up with ways that you can stay together. Commitment. Jesus says, I want you to be committed in your marriages. 
Some have said that Moses' commandment uh, was for three different reasons. One, to protect the sanctity of marriage. Two, protect the woman from being sent away on a whim. And three, to make her status as a divorced woman legal so she would not be viewed as a prostitute or runaway adulteress. Jesus sought to restore the sanctity that God had originally intended for the marriage relationship. And that's what he tells the Pharisees. No, I want you to stay married. I want you to be together. And so he then says, Whoever divorces, the word there, apaluo again, Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, pornea, sometimes translated fornication, sometimes translated marital unfaithfulness, and marries another, commits adultery. The word for adultery, moakea, we've seen this word a lot already in Matthew. Uh, in Scripture, generally refers to being faithless, sometimes translated as divorce or breaking a covenant. Now there is a textual variant here, some of you noticed as we went through here at the end of verse 9. Uh, some manuscripts add, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's what is taught in Luke 16. Other manuscripts have, except for sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That is from Matthew 5 that we looked at uh, several weeks ago. Jesus says no. Jesus says when you do this, except for sexual immorality, you commit adultery. It's not something to be taken trivial. It's not that you can just divorce and remarry. The disciples look at this and they say, well, now wait a minute. If it's, if it's that tough, if it's that hard, if we can't just go on to another woman when we get ready, then it's better not to marry. And Jesus says, yes, but not everyone can receive it. Not all are able to do that. And he goes on and talks about three types of eunuchs, some born that way, some made that way by men, and some choose to be. The point I want us to see in all of this this morning is Jesus' desire, Jesus' teaching, Jesus' commandment that we be committed in our marriage. Now, to, to the, the disciples at this time, to the Pharisees at this time, that was, that was unreal to them that he would expect something like that. That was, that was unusual that he would have that kind of standard. You know, to a lot of folks in the world today, it's just as unreal. To think that God would want us to stay with the same man or woman with which we begin. But that's exactly what God wants us to do. Commitment. The question we're asking this morning is, are we committed in our marriages? Are we committed in our marriage relationships? Now I know, I know that it's a struggle. And I know that many of you this morning are struggling. Some of you have talked to me, some of you haven't. But I know that marriage is under assault in America today. I know that the family is under assault in America today. I know that it's, that it's tough. I know that it's, it's, not that you're, it's not that you're bad people. It's not that you're wanting to do anything wrong. It's just that sometimes it's a struggle. And so when the rubber meets the road, how do we stay committed in marriage today? What is it that we can, what is it that we can do to maintain the teaching of Jesus and be sure that what God has joined together, we do not separate? Well, let me rattle off several things to you and hopefully it'll be of help remember that marriage is a covenant remember the vows that you made and take those vows seriously remember what you said when you stood before god and others and the commitment that you made to your marriage follow god's standards not the world's standards the world says a lot of things are okay that god says is not i would encourage you marry well Choose wisely. Young folks, when you think about choosing that mate for life, realize that it is a mate for life. Don't go into it with eyes closed, but go into it with eyes wide open. Resolve to be faithful. Just decide as husband and wife, I'm going to be faithful to my mate. Be careful of the situations in which you find yourselves in. If you find yourself in a situation where you're feeling a little uncomfortable and, and there are some red flags going up, well, there's a reason for those red flags going up. Get out of those situations. Serve each other. Serve each other. Be selfless. Put the other above yourself. Be honest. Be honest with each other about where you are, about where you're spending your money, about who you're texting, about who you're talking to on Facebook. Be honest and open with one another. Communicate well. Manage your finances well. Maintain a healthy sexual relationship. Resolve conflicts. Don't let things keep going on and on. Be forgiving. Be forgiving. 
Realize that struggles come. Realize that there are different stages of, of marriage, and, and those different stages, they, they have different um, challenges that come with them. Remember that. Take divorce off the table. Don't even kid about it. Don't joke about it. Don't threaten each other with it. Resolve to say, look, we're going to be together. We're going to stay together. Do some preventative maintenance. Read some good books. Go to marriage seminars. Listen to some good... Whatever it is that you can do that does some preventive maintenance. Some things that, that, that help your marriage along the way before it's ready to blow up. Kind of like servicing a car. It's a whole lot easier to service a car along and along and do some things with it to wait till the engine's ready to blow up. Do some preventative maintenance. Seek help. Things are going on in your marriage. Ask for help. It doesn't have to be me. I'm more than willing to talk to you, but just, just get some advice from some folks that will give you good advice. Choose carefully the friends to whom you listen. And don't wait too long. Don't wait too long. Sometimes it's the little things now that become huge later. Don't practice what I call stuff itis. Just keep stuffing things down and stuffing things down, and then they eventually explode. And finally, work on it. Work on it. Don't give up. Jesus says, you be committed. You be committed in your marriage relationship. What God has joined together, let not man separate. You decide. You decide. We're going to work on this. We're going to figure it out. If we have to get someone to help us, we'll get someone to help us. But we're committed to our marriages. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what the world would see if they saw more Christians committed in their marriages? Well, Jesus goes on from this in verses 13, 15, and, and has this very brief passage here about the, the children, the children coming to me, and, and I simply call this commitment as children. The children were brought to him, he lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Commitment is children. The situation is this. The children were being brought to, to Jesus. Now this, this word for children is the one that we've talked about before, paid on, uh, used to refer to as infants and toddlers and small children. What's happening in this situation is, is they're being brought to Jesus. Well, for, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, the disciples rebuked them. Now, was it because they were pestering Jesus in their opinion? Was it because the disciples felt like they had some other things to do? We don't know for sure, but the disciples rebuked the people. It seemed to be the parents that were bringing the children. They rebuked them. They just wanted Jesus to lay their hands, his hands on them and pray. Custom of the day. Parents would often take children to some of the, the great teachers and ask for a blessing in this way. They, they wanted the approval and the, and the encouragement of Jesus, the great teacher. But the disciples rebuked them. This is from the, the Greek word epitomao, and, and it actually carries the idea of threatening. So it was, a, it was a harsh rebuke. But notice the response of Jesus. The response of Jesus was to rebuke the rebukers. He said, no, you let... These little children come to me. You do not hinder them. Matter of fact, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. The kingdom of heaven will be populated by those who have the trusting, humble attitude of little children. And so, the question for us then about commitment is, how can we be committed like children? What is it that about a child that Jesus says He wants us to be? Well, we could come up with a whole list of things. I, I think of of the trusting, how a, how a child is trusting, how they put their, their confidence and their faith in someone else because they're not able to do so many things and they have to trust that parent or that sibling or, or whomever it is to help them. Do we, do we trust God like that? Are we willing to put our faith and confidence in Him? I think about their humility. And again, as we said last week, when you think about children in the first century, understand they were near the bottom of the social scale. They were... They were almost nothing. You think about their humility and how humble a child is. Think about their forgiveness. Now, I know children fight, especially if they're siblings. But think about how much easier they're able to get over things and forgive one another 
than we are as adults. Think about how that, that it seems like one day they're ready to claw their, each other's eyes out, and the next day they're best friends again. Forgiving. I think about serving. How if you ask a child to bring you something or do something for you, most are willing. Now, you may say, well, yeah, that's because I threatened them. Well, that may be. But so many times, if, if you just ask a child to do something with you or for you, they will. I think about their loyalty. I think about how uh, children are loyal to each other and loyal to the adults around them. The question is, are we committed? Are we committed like children? Are we committed in our marriages? And are we committed like little children? And then finally, the last section of this chapter, what takes up the rest of the chapter, is what I'm saying, commitment in everything. Commitment in everything. It's the story that we often uh, refer to is the rich young man or the rich young ruler. We kind of take the different uh, accounts of this story and put them all together and give him that title. But this is, this is the way it goes on in Matthew. Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you will love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, Well, all these have I kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. But Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you have followed me, will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for not my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Here's the situation very quickly. The, the young man comes to Jesus, and as far as we can tell, he is honest and sincere in what he asks. As far as we can tell, he wants to do what is right. And so the first question is this, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Knew who Jesus was, knew who he was about, what do I have to do? Jesus' answer is, well, you keep the commandments. You keep the commandments. And some ask here, why, some translations add here, why do you call me good? The second question then is, which ones? Okay, keep the commandments. No, no, Jesus, I, I, want, I want more specifics. I want to know exactly what you're talking about. Which ones are you talking about? And so Jesus says, okay, the second answer. Shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And then, perhaps as a surprise to everyone standing around, the young man says, okay, no problem. I've done these. I'm good. I've, I've, I've done all those things that you've said. Uh, some of the manuscripts here add from my youth. But then he asked another question. And that is, what else? What else? Okay, Lord, I, you said do the commandments. I said, okay, got that. I asked you which ones. You gave me the specifics. Okay, I've said I've done that. Now, what else? Is there anything more? What else do I lack? The third answer was not what he was wanting to hear. For Jesus says, sell what you have, give to the poor, and follow me. You see, Jesus knew. Jesus knew that he wasn't committed in everything. So he identified what that one thing was. I believe that if this had been a different person with a commitment to a different thing, this story would read a little different. For this, for this man, it was his possessions. For this man, it was his riches. What Jesus is saying is it takes total commitment. 
If you want to be complete, he says, the word teleos, that means uh, completion or mature. If you want to be complete, if you want to be mature, then you sell your possessions, give to the poor, and follow me. The possessions, by the way, is from the word katima, and it likely included everything. Land, houses, furniture, it's a very broad word. Jesus says, you follow me. You give up that which you are putting your faith, your confidence, your trust, your hope. You, you give up that and you follow me. You be committed to me. A text says that the young man went away sorrowful. He had found what it was that he lacked. And he wasn't willing. He wasn't willing to commit to Jesus that much. Well, then we've got the explanation. Jesus then turned and taught about how difficult it was for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word for difficult here is duskalos. And it's actually interesting used only here in this story in the Bible. The only time this word is used. The point Jesus is making when he says that it is difficult, that it is hard, is that it's about trusting in God, not trusting in riches. And he uses a proverbial saying about the camel going through the eye of a needle, basically representing that which was impossible. Now the reason this was used is that the camel was the largest animal in Palestine, while the eye of a needle represents the smallest opening. The word for needle is raphis, a common sewing needle, nothing special about that. And we know that Jesus has used this kind of imagery often when he, he uses things such as speck and log and mustard seed and mountain. We've seen this in the book of Matthew. He's, he's, he's going to two extremes. And he, he talks about the camel, which was known as the, the largest animal there in Palestine, being so big and that small opening of a needle. His point was well made. It hit home because now the disciples are astonished. They're amazed. Well, what do you mean? Because to them, riches meant blessings from God. But well, what do you mean? How, how, who's going to enter then? And Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. It, it's about who you put your trust. It's about to whom you are really committed that makes the difference. You know Peter's going to speak up, right? We've learned to expect that. So Peter speaks up and he says, well, what about us? What about us, Lord? Haven't we sacrificed? Haven't we been willing to give up things? And Jesus says, yes, yes. And you're going to be rewarded. The ESV says in the New World, some of the other translations say the regeneration. There's a lot of debate as to when exactly that Jesus is referring to here. I think it's safe to say that he is saying that they're going to be rewarded. I think probably he's talking about eternity here. Those who sacrifice will be rewarded. Jesus says, yes, yes, I know your sacrifices. I understand your sacrifices. I realize your commitment. And yes, and yes, you'll receive your reward. For everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father, or mother, or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So the question then is this. How can we be committed in everything. How can we be committed in everything? What is it this morning that you lack? What is it that's keeping you from following Jesus? Is it, is it like this man? Is it riches? Is it material possessions? Is it stuff? Is that what's keeping you from having the relationship with God that you need to have? Is it your attitude? Is your attitude getting in the way? Is that what needs to be changed? Is that what needs to be different in order for you to be fully committed and trusting God? Maybe it's your friendships. Maybe it's the folks with whom you're hanging around that are influencing you in a negative way. Maybe it's, it, it, it's some of those people that you need to say, look, I'm a Christian, and this is the way I'm going to act, this is the way I'm going to behave, and, and if, if you can't agree with that or be a part of that, then we're not going to be able to hang around anymore. Is it your influence? Is it your influence? Is it, is it your example out in the community? Is it what people see in you when you're not in this building? Is that what needs to change? Is that what it is that's keeping you from being committed? Maybe it's, maybe it's lack of prayer, or lack of Bible study, or, or lack... I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. 
But I think the point Jesus is making here is, whatever it is, whatever it is that is keeping you from making a total commitment, you give that up, and you come and you follow me. A great challenge. A great challenge in this whole chapter. To be committed in our marriages. To be committed like children. Yes, to be committed in everything. The question we close with this morning is a simple one. Are you committed? Are you committed this morning to your marriage relationship? Are you committed this morning like little children? Are you committed not like the rich young ruler? But are you committed enough to do what he was unwilling to do and and figure out what it is that you lack and be willing to give that up to follow Jesus? We want hearts on fire. Something that is a theme that runs throughout Scripture all the way back from Genesis and all the way to Revelation is that God wants committed people. He wants committed people. He doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. He wants your commitment. This morning, are you committed? Have you committed your life to Him through baptism for the forgiveness of your sins? To to be raised to walk a new life? To be that new person? Are you committed this morning in the way that you live out that Christian life in your faithfulness and obedience? Are you committed? If not, why not? If we can help you this morning with that commitment, if we can assist you in becoming a Christian, we would love to do that. If you just need some help, have some struggles, whatever the case may be, if we can help this morning anyway, please come as we stand and as we sing together. Just as I am without one plea, shed for me and that thou
number 18, if you're using Psalm, bear in mind that you take note of the Lord's Son. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your son's sacrifice and what you gave up for us. We thank you so very much for this table and what it represents. We hope you would bless the spread as it represents your son's broken body as he hung for us on that cross. We hope that we will take it in a manner well pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen.
Light manner, Heavenly Father, as we partake of this cup, the fruit of the vine, which us Christians represents Christ's blood that was shed as he hung on the cruel cross of Calvary for the remission of our sin. And let us examine ourselves and take it in a manner pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name, amen. That we, that we don't deserve any of that what we have. So let's get back in a cheerful manner, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for our material blessings. We know that we are stewards and have to give an account for what we do. We thank you so very much for everything that you have given us. May we give back in a cheerful manner. In Christ's name, amen. We have several announcements before we close this morning. Our uh, number in Sunday school was 248, and in the morning worship services, we have 340. On, uh, on the back of your worship, order of worship bulletin, there are several announcements. Um, we need to look at those. Of course, Landmark Nursing Home Devotional today is at 4 o'clock. The Teen Mission Team will meet today at 4.30 in the Teen Activities Center. 
And um, our winning Wednesdays begin this coming Wednesday night, June the 1st. Our first speaker will be Brother Willie Nettle from the Bypass Congregation in Vicksburg. Uh, we'll have a fellowship meal at 6 p.m. in the Annex. If you plan to attend, plan to bring several dishes and sign in the list in the foyer if you can help with these meals. And the uh, theme of the Winning Wednesdays this year is uh, conversion stories and acts. And uh, Brother Willie will be speaking about the Corinthians. Mr. and Mrs. Dale Kendrick request the honor of your presence at the marriage of their daughter, Caitlin Noel, to Craig Wilson Chun, Saturday, June 4th at 6 o'clock in the evening at the Foot Street Church of Christ in Corinth. And then there will be a reception following at the Shiloh Ridge Club in Corinth. Now, Vacation Bible School begins on June 6th at uh, 9 o'clock from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. classes for, for two-year-old to adults. If you need transportation or information, you can call the church office 728-5544. If you have a child who will be attending Vacation Bible School, ask them to fill out, or please fill out a registration form provided out in the foyer. If you need a ride, of course, uh, or if you can provide transportation, also sign a list in the foyer. I have some uh, cards to read. Thank you for all the calls, visits, and concern for me after my accident. I'm especially thankful for your prayers from Brother Ralph Williams. Where do we start? We are ever so grateful for all you have done during this time. Words cannot express the love you have given us. Our daddy, Stacy Lowry, is smiling and saying, I love my church family. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May God's blessing be upon you all. That's from the Stacy Lowry family. There is quite an extensive list of um, sick and homebound in the bulletin. Please look those over. I will mention that Cassie Stewart is in Magnolia Hospital following hip surgery. Andy Kane is in the Magnolia ICU, and his father, Lex Kane, is in, also in Magnolia Hospital. I don't have any room numbers. Uh, Tammy Prentice is in Longwood in room eight. And Brother Adrian Edge, of course, is, as has been mentioned, is back with us this morning. And um, we wish all these a speedy recovery, and we'll keep those in our prayers. That's all our announcements. If you'd like to stand, we'll have a closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day and its many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And we pray, Father, that you'll watch over us now as we dismiss to our respective ways. Guide, guard, and direct us, and bring us back again at the next appointed hour, if it be thy will. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen.